Father, we've come together tonight to study our Bibles, and we're so grateful that the Holy Spirit is here. We don't have a band tonight for music. We don't have praise and worship, but we have our faith, and because we believe in you, you send your Holy Spirit, the teacher of the church, to guide us into all truth. Father, I thank you for my assignment tonight, and I pray for the hearers that they're able to comprehend what I'm going to share with them tonight. And Lord, this is an important word because this is the sum of everything we have believed for. This is the end of, the, of our faith. And so, Father, I thank you for this assignment. I welcome the Holy Spirit, and I, re, and I submit to you. You can correct me, stop me, change anything I say, because I'm totally submitted to you. Anoint this word to our ears. Bless the people who hear it. And I want to be certain you get all the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Now, this can be a very meaty word, but we'll go through it slow, and uh, it, it's, it's a huge subject, but um, I'm trying to condense it down to 45 minutes so we can have a discussion afterward. So if you have your Bibles, would you throw them open to Matthew's Gospel? chapter 24 and verse 3 Matthew 24 3 I shouldn't do that I'm on I'm on internet in Matthew 24 and 3 as Jesus sat upon the Mount of Olives the disciples came unto him privately saying tell us when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of your coming and the end of the world? Now, I believe that Jesus had spent a considerable amount of time teaching his disciples that this world as we know it is going to come to an end. Amen. And as Christians, that's not hard to believe because we've been taught that and we've had the scriptures to show it. And we see right here that the disciples know the world as we know it is going to come to an end. Everything is going to go through a drastic change, and the only ones who believe this are the Christians. Yes. I was trying to win my brother to the Lord, and I told him that, you know, at the end of the world, there's going to be a fire. And he said, that isn't for a thousand years from now. And I said, I said, listen, when you die, it's the end of the world. <laughs> isn't that right? <laughs> so... So it's not as far off as you think it is. You know, I don't know how, I don't know when, uh, you know, your, your soul is going to be required of you, but I know that you have to be prepared to meet the Lord. So, so Jesus, uh, they, they want Jesus to tell them, um, uh, what are the signs of your coming? And then verse 4, Jesus answered, said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. And you've heard, you've heard me say this over and over and over. The first things out of Jesus' mouth is don't let people deceive you. And, I've, and I use that scripture and many others to tell you that deception is a choice. If you've been deceived, you chose to be deceived. It's a choice. Because he says, take heed. In other words, beware that no man deceive you. Check things out. You got a Bible? Find out what the Bible says compared to what they say. Amen. And then um, he begins, And many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. So the, the word Christ there, he says, Many are going to come claiming to represent me, claiming to have an anointing, but they're going to deceive many because people were not walking soberly. They weren't working with their eyes open. And they got deceived. And so uh, the disciples, you know, Jesus is going to be given the signs. And number one sign is deception. And it's going to be in the church that people are going to come, come claiming. Uh, I, I got a, there's a good one. There's a, there's a guy wrote to Jerry Seville once. And he said, uh, Brother Jerry, he says, I have a revelation. And I believe I'm the only one with this revelation. And I'm writing it to you to share it with you. And see what you think. Well, Brother Jerry read his revelation. He wrote him back a letter. And he says, dear brother, he says, I read your revelation and you're right. And he says, I think you're the only one that has this. I don't think God has it yet. <laughs> you know? 
Well, isn't he afraid of hurting his feelings? It, better to hurt your feelings yes. than hurt your place in heaven. Right. All right, and then he, he goes on there in verse 6. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled or frightened. For all these things must come to pass, but the end's not yet. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. One but it, Somebody had a Bible that read race against race. And there shall be famines and pestilences, which are plagues and earthquakes in many different places. And all these are the beginning of sorrows. So now Jesus gave them the signs. He gave us the signs. And if you look at these signs, every generation, including his disciples, they, they had those signs in their time. Amen. And we're having those signs. So every generation from Jesus should be looking for him at the end. It should be looking for the end of the world. And then he said, this is the beginning of sorrows. Now, that word sorrows there, if you study it out, it's talking about a woman given birth, child. You know, this is the beginning of labor pains. And he says, this is just the beginning. And he said, when all of this takes place, then it's going to give birth to something completely new. And so he says, this is the beginning of sorrows. So in that context, uh, we don't want to be troubled because it's really going to turn into something much better than what we have right now. So the title of our Bible study tonight is The End of the World. They asked Jesus when the end of the world is, and um, now we're going to pursue that and... and Follow what, what that the end comes. Okay, so now go over to Acts chapter 1 and verse 9. Acts 1 and 9. And when Jesus had spoken these things, while they, his disciples, beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Hmm. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, You men of Galilee, why stand you gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner, so have you seen him go into heaven. So now Jesus was caught up to heaven. He was sitting there talking to him. He gave him their final instructions. Then all of a sudden, he's up in heaven. Now, we could say it this way, Jesus was raptured. Amen. Because that's what a rapture is. You're suddenly just taken up. Jesus was not the first man to be raptured. He was number three. That's right. Who was number one? Enoch. Enoch. No, it's Enoch. Oh, sorry. I don't know. <laughs> and then Elijah. Elijah. And so they were raptured in one and two. And now Jesus is raptured up, and he's number three. Praise God. Now, the angels here, and I'm going through this slow so we don't have any confusion. The angels said, as you have seen him go, he will come back. Now, I submit to you, Jesus has already been here. He's coming back two more times. And I'll show you that in the scripture. So they said, um, uh, as you've seen him go, he's going to return. And I submit to you that Jesus is going to come back twice. So, and I'll, I'll prove that in the scripture. I'm not going to leave you hanging there. Praise God. All right, now, let's go back then to Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 2. Hebrews 9, oh, Hebrews 9 and 28. Hebrews 9, 28. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. So people who are looking for him, he is going to appear to them. So what if a person's not looking for him? They're not going to see him. Now, when I was studying this out, and something the Lord showed me a long time ago, that word there, um, uh, 
Looking is also means willing. Those who are willing to go are going to go. Now, who are these people? These are the people that Jesus spoke of in Matthew when he said, if you're going to come after me, you're going to have to deny yourself and take up your cross. If you're, got, if you're packing a cross around with you so that you can crucify your flesh when it tries to get out of hand, then you are actively looking for the return of Jesus. Amen. Praise God. So that's what, uh, that's, uh, so he promises that he's going to appear to those who are looking for him. And just turn that around. If you're not looking, you're not going to see him. So his first appearing, the first appearance of Jesus was when he was born in Bethlehem and he had his earthly ministry as a man, which was about 33 years. That was his flesh and blood ministry. And then the angel says he's coming back. Now, I'm going to show you in the scriptures, like I said, where he's going to come back twice. He's already been here once. He's going to come back two more times. So the, the prophecies that you read here, you have to read all of those prophecies. Otherwise, you think it's just one event, and it's not. It's a two events, and we'll, we'll find those events. So now go back to uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 13. I think you know the scripture. I read it sometimes at funerals. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. Paul says, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not as even as others who have no hope. Now, that word sleep there is talking about people who died in faith, and they are in the kingdom of God. They have been taken off. Uh, they're in heaven now. They have been taken out of the bosom of Abraham, and they're all in heaven. And the Bible likes to refer to them as asleep. I mean, they, they, that'll refer to them as being dead, but sleep is a better translation because, and we'll, we'll see here why here in just a minute. In verse 14, For if you believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also would sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Now watch this. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then which we are alive and remain shall be caught up together in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. So this is the second return of Jesus. But notice he does not touch, he does not set foot on the earth. He comes back, but he stays up in the, in the air or in the clouds. And he calls up those who are looking for him. Only those who are looking for him. Jesus, he doesn't touch the ground. And so, dang it. Oh, I, I wrote a little note here and I, I couldn't, I had to remind myself why I wrote it. So he calls up those who are looking for him. We meet him in the air. And um, I want you to see here that the graves are emptied and the saints that he brings with him are reunited and they get their glorified bodies. If, you, if we are here at the catching away of the church, we don't die. We're just taken up in the air on the web. We get a glorified body just like Jesus. Now, Jesse Duplantis, the last time he was here, he was in my office and he looked at me and he said, Brother Jerry, he says, let me tell you something. He says, I'm going to be very, very shocked and surprised if we're not the generation that gets taken up. And, you know, now he didn't set a date or anything like that. But when he was caught up into heaven, the Lord said, he says, Jesse, tell my people I'm coming soon. And Jesse said, Lord, they know that. He says, no, they don't. And that's all that was said. He didn't give a date or anything else. We know, you know, Jesus can come at any time. He could come in our lifetime or the next lifetime. We don't know. There's, there's signs, but no date. So this, so this here is the rapture of the church. This is the fourth rapture. The first was Enoch or Enoch. 
Elijah, Jesus, and now it's the church. Now they're now we are caught up, spirit for uh, we're spirit and body, and we've got the glorified body. And like the Bible says, there forever shall we be with the Lord. Glory to God! If you ever start getting yeah. depressed, read that. Comfort one another with these words, because now now you know how it ends. Well, of course, you've already known that, but sometimes you have to go back and read this and find out. Remind yourself how this all turns out. I, I like one time um, when the uh, somebody when the devil starts giving you. Uh, he starts hammering you and bringing all these attacks against you. Remind him, remind him where you're going to spend eternity. And if he persists, remind him where he's going to spend eternity. Amen. He don't like that kind of a sermon. Yeah, devil, you're going to be in hell forever. I'm going to be in paradise. Praise God. And so I was just listening to Dennis Burke. I think it was Dennis Burke or Mac Hammond. And the devil is relishing all of his free time right now because he knows it's going to come to an end and he is going to be incarcerated forever. Praise God. But we'll, get, we'll read a scripture and find out what happens to him. All right. You with me okay so far? Pretty good? All right. If you're not, don't say anything. All right. Now let's go to Revelations chapter 19. Revelations chapter 19 and 9. I'm just lifting a scripture out of here that confirms what I'm going to share with you. In Revelations 19 and 9, and uh, he said to me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he has said unto me, These are the true sayings of God. So when we're caught up, or if we're the gender, well, we're all, everybody's going to get raptured. I can remember one time years ago, I don't know, some of you may remember Helen Buckner, some of you may not have known her, but she was a neat old lady that come to church, and you could always tell when she laughed because she cackled, and and Joe McCroskey would listen to her on the tapes, he said, I heard Helen, they liked the way she laughs, but she told me one day, she said, Pastor, a lady told me that I was going to be here for the rapture, do you believe that's true? And I says, yes, Helen, you're going to be in the rapture. Yahoo! And she says, and then she comes, you got a scripture for that? And I said, yes. Jesus is going to bring back those who are asleep in him. They're going to get their bodies, and then we're going to join them in the air. So every, every saint's going to be in the rapture. She says, Yahoo! <laughs> Praise God. All right, so now we're the fourth group to be raptured. We're up in heaven. And we sit down for we get married and then have the marriage supper of the Lamb. And now this is this is really interesting. The the supper lasts, and I'm gonna say this and it's gonna sound goofy, but I'll but we'll I'll fix it in a minute. The marriage supper of the Lamb lasts seven years. Now the reason I say that is is because while we're at the marriage supper of the Lamb, the when we're taken out, the Antichrist is released. And the world has a seven-year tribulation period. And so as far as they're concerned, we're gone seven years. And unless they know the scriptures, they think that, that you know, and there's all kinds of speculation when the, when the church is taken out where people say, well, they were abducted by aliens or, you know, they have all kinds of theories and stuff. And I don't know what they're going to say. I really don't care. Uh, I'm going to be at the marriage supper of the Lamb. So we're at the marriage supper of the Lamb. We're, we're gone seven years as far as earth time is concerned. But where we're at, it's only one day because when you step into eternity, there is no more time. There is no time. You don't, um, I'll tell you right up front, when, uh, when you go to heaven, leave your watches at home. <laughs> they don't mean anything up there. There's just, there's just no time. Praise God. Now, I think about these things all the time because it's a whole new world. And, and everything's going to be so different, but I'm getting ahead of myself and I ought not to do that. Praise God. All right, now, go back to Revelations chapter 7. Look at Revelations chapter 7 and verse 11. Now watch this. 
Now, remember that um, the fourth group of people to be resurrected are the pre-tribulation saints that, that I expect all of you to be in that group. Now, in Revelation chapter 7 and verse 11, and all the angels stood round about the throne, about the elders and the four beasts, and fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and where did they come from? And I said unto them, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Mm. So now, three and a, approximately three and a half years into the tribulation, those people who were not looking for Jesus, who had, uh, at his appearing and love his appearing, are, have repented and now they're caught up into heaven. Praise God. Now they're cut up. They're, they're, and it says they've washed their robes. So their robes indicate uh, righteousness, but they were meddling with sin. And during the tribulation period, they repented. And I don't know if these are the people who, you know, were going to be beheaded for the mark of the beast. I don't know all that. Hilton Sutton knows. I don't. And so now in the middle, of, so they're caught up into heaven. Now, let me read to you something that Hilton Sutton says about these people. These are the mid these are the mid tribulation saints. This is the fifth rapture. Jesus does not meet them in the air as he does his church. There is no sound of the trumpet at their rapture, nor is there any accompanying resurrection. They are not presented with crowns of gold. They do not sit on the thrones. They do not sing the, the new song. They sing the song of Moses and the Lamb. It is strictly said of them, these are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Praise God. Amen. If you've ever listened to Kenneth Copeland or Jerry Seville or Kenneth Hagan or uh, Jesse Duplantis or any of those guys and they start talking about the end of the world in the last days, you'll always hear them say, I'm going out on the first load. Yeah. <laughs> going out on the fourth rapture. Yeah. <laughs> Praise God. So um, they had robes, but were soiled. And so they repented and they show up in heaven. And there is a great multitude of these people. Mm. Praise God. So once again, we're talking about the end of the world. This is futuristic. It's prophetic. And I think we need to know about it because we're going to live there. We're going to be a part of this. Amen. And, you, and you don't want to be too surprised when the Lord comes around and starts commanding things and putting things in order. It's, oh yeah, I read about that. I was at Brother Jerry's Bible study. I learned about that. And the Lord said, that's right. I, should, I, I told him to teach you that. I don't know if that'll happen or not. All right, let's go back to Revelations chapter 19 and verse 11. Revelations 19:11. This oh this is a good one. And I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he does judge and make war. His eyes were flame of fire and on his head were many crowns and he had a name written that no man that no man knew but he himself and he was clothed with vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Remember, Jesus and the Word is always the same person. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses. Ha! We go up as saints and come back as cowboys. <laughs> Glory to God. Uh, if you haven't been on a horse lately, you might want to take a, a, a lesson or two in preparation for the catching way of the church. No, I, I believe that um, you won't have any problem riding that horse. I had, a, I had a lady one time come to me. She's almost in tears. She was a horse person and she loved horses, hay burners. And she says, Brother Jerry, I love my horse so much. Do you think that I could ask God to bring him to heaven with me? 
and I, I didn't, and I then this, I had some wisdom come to me, and I said, "Sister, let me tell you something. When you get to heaven, and you look around at all the splendor and the gold and the jewels, and the people and the joy and the flowers and all that's there, the last thing you're going to think of is that old nag. <laughs> Not a nag." And I said, I should have, should have, if it's not white, leave it home, because we all ride white horses. <laughs> and she, I don't know how she, I don't know how she took that. Maybe she's still believing for her horse. So then there's a big debate: Can we bring our pets to heaven? Only service dogs, but they have to be stuffed. I don't know. All right. So the armies which were in heaven followed him upon their white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. So now, at the end of the tribulation period, Jesus and his saints are going to come back to earth. Now this is the third time. This time he makes contact with the earth. So, he, so I told you there was two, two times out. This is the third and last time. Now he comes back, and with the saints that you and I, we begin to rule this world. Yes. Praise God. Hallelujah. It's into the tribulation period, and we're going to rule and reign with him for a thousand years. A thousand years. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Mm -mm -mm. Now notice here, that we're going to rule and reign with a rod of iron. Now, um, look over to, yeah, let, okay, well, no, I'm gonna get, I don't want to get out of myself. We're going to stay right there. No, I, I'm, going to, I'm going to do this. Okay, look at Revelation chapter 20, verse 1. Then I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent. You and I have been casting the devil out and deal with him. Here comes an angel, grabs him by the neck, and, and, um, and binds him for a thousand years, and casts him into the bottomless pit and shuts him up, and sets a seal on him, that he should not deceive the nations no more till the thousand years shall be filled, then he'd be loose for a little season. That, that's going to be a very short time. So during that thousand year reign, the devil's going to be locked up. You know, I don't know about you, but it's very hard to imagine any time in my life where there's not demonic pressure. Now, probably the closest I've come to it is in the presence of the Lord because there's fullness of joy. But there's always demonic pressure. And I don't, as human beings... We don't know what it's like to have demonic influence completely shut out of our lives. It's just, you know, and I, I think about it and, you, you know, the best day of your life and how you felt just never ends, you know, and you're thinking, wow. And I, I think about these times and I'm thinking, you know, and it brings comfort to my heart to know what, I'm, what, what I've gotten into myself receiving Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Praise God. All right, now, um, let's go over to Luke chapter 16 and verse 10. Look at Luke 16 and 10. You know this scripture. Look what it says. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. If therefore you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if you've not been faithful in that which is another man's, who will give to you that which is your own? Now, um, the devil, where were my, uh, oh. We, if we are faithful with material things, because that's what mammon is, then we can be trusted with spiritual things. And God uses that as a, a measuring device. Praise God. 
And so we are going, those who have been faithful to the Lord are going to be the ones that he gives position to during the millennial reign of Christ. Praise God. And it doesn't matter if you've been a, a preacher or a minister or just an intercessor or just somebody who's simply done whatever God told them to do. God's going to give you a rod and make you a, 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 a commander or a leader or a president or a king or something over a particular, re, a particular region. You know, I, I believe all these, all these mayors are going to be replaced with God's people. Governors, uh, all these people, all these people, the police, all these people are going to be replaced with God's people. And we're going to rule and reign with him for a thousand years. Praise, Praise God. God. And you don't take lip off anybody. And they can't hurt you. You have a glorified body. They don't. They can't argue with you. Man, hallelujah. Wouldn't that... They make, they make a good marriage. <laughs> Never mind. All right. I don't want to get in trouble. <laughs> Probably already in trouble anyway. We, and this is, and I, I've been saying this for years. I got this revelation. And a couple of years ago, I heard Kenneth Copeland repeat the same thing. I totally believe that we're going to finish what Adam started. And what did Adam begin? He was going to turn this whole world into a garden. And I believe in a thousand years, we'll turn this whole world into a garden. And you know, the sea is going to be, is going to be, is going to be taken care of. There's no, there'll be no more sea. <laughs> Praise God. No more sea. And the Bible says that in the book of Revelations. There'll be no more sea. Hallelujah. Because how are you going to plant a garden on the ocean? Glory to God. And so I believe that we're going to turn this world into a garden once again. Praise God. Kenneth Copeland says, man was never created to live in cities. They were created to live in gardens. <laughs> my garden. I, I, don't, I don't think my garden qualifies. I've got a lot of napweed. <laughs> so what we, what we do in this life determines what God, how God can use us during that millennial reign of Christ. Now, I may, this, this may sound far-fetched, it may sound far out, but it's, it's Bible, and that's what's going to happen. If, if anybody ever, ever wants to be sure of this stuff, Hilton Sutton has his book. I've had this book for years. It's called Rapture, Get Right or Get Left. And I don't loan it out. But if you ever, can ever find it, it's one of the best books on end times you can ever read. Because that guy, he just has so much insight, and he, he uses the Bible to interpret itself. Glory to God. All right, I have one more scripture. Let's go back to the book of Revelations, chapter 21 and verse 1. Revelation 21 and 1. John said he's getting towards the end of the revelation that uh, the Lord gave to Jesus and then Jesus gave to Paul. He says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. And there was no more sea. I told you. I told you there was no more sea. No, don't listen to me. <laughs> see, I'm telling you, there's a whole new world coming. There's a, there's a, a, a new heaven and a new earth. Things are going to totally change. Amen. Praise God. The lion is going to lay down with the lamb. The, the child, uh, little children will play with adders. Praise God. And, and, then it, and then in verse 2, he says, And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them and shall be their people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And this is the, then God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Yes, amen. You know, when was the last time you cried? <laughs> if you can't, I will. Two and a half hours ago. I watched uh, the president's speech from last night where he honored that woman whose husband, the Navy SEAL, was killed. And she was just crying, and I just, I was just crying with her. You know, just 
the guy is a hero, you know, and, and, then, and then there's some people that thought, well, he just, he just flaunting, he just using this for political hay. That, that, that is a terrible thing, you know. Every time I get around memorials or, or servicemen that have been injured and stuff, it touches my heart because I, I kind of have a little idea of what them guys going through. And it's, you know, they're, if you ever go out to Fort Harrison, Bud can tell you he's out there all the time. I seen Bud out the other day, but I went the other way, so I never met him. <laughs> I had to. I had, a diff- had an appointment somewhere else. But those guys are just, they're all hurting. And they're, and they're out there, you know, and, and once you get into the system out there, they take very good care of you. But those guys are hurting. There's one poor guy. He'd come out there, and he was in the lab. You know, uh, you have to give blood every once in a while. they got to test your blood and all this stuff. Well, he'd come in there, and he was supposed to give a urine sample, and, and he's, he's gone for about a half hour, and he comes back. He says, I couldn't get any. She says, well, that's okay, John. Go sit out in the waiting room, and, and when you feel like it, you can come back. He says, okay. So I come out, look, and he's there drinking coffee. <laughs> But they do really take good care of those people, and they should because some of them guys have been through hell and back, and nobody knows what they've been through. And that's the, you know my grandfather died out there. He he my grandfather was a he he enlisted in the war World War One. He had I think he had six weeks in boot camp. He got on a train headed for. Uh, New York, and he was going to get on a ship and head overseas. They all got drunk and threw the conductor, tried to control him. They threw him out the back and another train ran over him. But because it was wartime and they didn't know who did it, they just looked the other way. He got on a ship and he, he, he told me this himself. He said, Jerry, we got on a ship, troop transport headed for the war zone. And he says, we just got out of sight of the Statue of Liberty and they announced that that uh, Germany had surrendered, and said the ship took a big turn and came back and discharged me. That was his extent of military time, and he died at Fort Harrison. He just loved that place because they took such good care of him. <laughs> he just he was a he was a committed alcoholic, and he just died out there. <laughs> he's, gone. he's he's an interesting guy. He he was a German. He didn't know I became a Polak. <laughs> so what we do in this life is going to determine what we what happens the next and then look at verse 4 and God shall wipe away all the tears from their eyes and there be shown no more death no reason to cry for sorrow Amen. you know this there's just no reason for it no more death they say I, I've, I've read accounts like Jesse Duplantis and this other uh, several other accounts I just interested in what goes on up there and I know that they're their men's accounts and you have to find the Bible to back up what they say but every one of them say the same thing that the flowers are alive and they're singing and when you step on them they go down and when you take your foot they come back because there's no death in heaven yeah. praise God and neither sorrow nobody's ever sad could you can you imagine never having another sad day in your life I mean just you just tickled pink the whole day nor crying, no more crying, neither shall there be any more pain. You know, and I know that a lot of people in the church live with pain, and I know you're standing for your health, but that, it won't exist anymore. And I just imagine that kind of life. It's a whole new world that we've never been in before, and it's going to happen. Praise God, the end of the world. And for the former things are passed away. And then look, he says, and then he that sat upon the throne said, behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, right for these things are true and faithful. All things are going to become new. We're going to live in a world we have never, ever been in before. But if you read the scriptures and you believe, then you're going to be comforted with those things. Praise God. You know, you know I've done a lot of funerals and some of them are... Some of them are very difficult, and some are very, very sad. You know, the last one I did with Brother Dickey was, was very painful. I love Brother Dickey, and it was a very hard one to do. But then you got to stop and realize that right now, 
he's in a better place than you and I. That's right. You know, and right. and if and you got and you use that to comfort yourself, but he is, he's in a better place. And I could just imagine, I could just imagine him up there teasing the girls and the angels, because that was his nature. That was what's the way he liked to do it. Praise God. But no more, no more funerals. Glory to God. Now, like um, Kenneth Copeland said, the longer you live, the more funerals you're going to attend. Well, that's true. So, but if, but um, the, there's funerals and then there's funerals. And some of them are homegoing celebrations. And those aren't that bad. You know, my dad, when he died, we didn't shed a tear. We were so glad he was out of that body. And we knew that he's, he says, I am. He said, I'm, I received Jesus. I, I spoke in those tongues once or twice. And he says, I know where I'm going. And so we were so glad that he left Amen. his body. Same with my mother. You know, when she's dealing with Alzheimer's, I just prayed, Lord, I just want mom to go to sleep and just wake up in heaven. And one day she did. I went in to see her and she's laying there and her eyes are open. And I said, what, what's wrong with my mom? And she, the nurse says, Jerry, she died. And I says, what? I, I, just, I just came to see her. And he says, well, you're about an hour late. Then I thought, well, Lord, that's what I prayed for. I want her to yeah. go home. Yeah. Praise God. So you want to have relatives there so when you get there, they can show you around. Otherwise, you go, oh, what's this here thing? Oh, river of life? Ooh. Yeah. But if you have a relative, don't ask them. I'll tell you what it is. It's a river of life. You can eat this fruit here. <laughs> and, and come over this part of heaven, Jerry. There's no cats over here. That part over there is where they keep the horses. <laughs> Praise God. So, folks, this world as we know it's going to come to an end. Amen. And and we need to have some insight of what's going to happen. Praise God. You know, I think I've told you where when my dad died, I, I wasn't there. I'd been there for several days and I just had to get away. So I went to my job and I was praying and he, and he left. And my sisters told me that they felt a breeze go by them and they really felt that an angel had come into the room. And so I went to the Lord and I said, Lord, now you know my dinghy sisters. <laughs> he said, yes, I know your sisters. And I said, they said there was an angel in there and he says, they were right. I says, really? My sisters were right? He said, yes. He says, if you remember when Lazarus died, the angels brought him into heaven. He says, whenever I have a child of God, I send an angel to bring him home. Praise God. So when it's time to leave this tabernacle, leave this body, don't be as scared if you see a great big angel. Right. He's coming to take you home. Amen. Come on forward to carry me home. Mm -hmm. Father, I, I, I thank you for this word tonight. And we are believers. We know this is going to happen one day. We know that this world, as we know it's going to come to an end. And we're going to be in a far, far better place. There's no comparison from this life into the next. And Lord, we want to bring as many people as we can into this world with us. And Father, we thank you for sharing with the revelations through the scriptures of what we have to come forward. Because Lord, if we didn't know what to expect, then how would we have joy to receive it? But Lord, now we believe the scriptures. And so we have joy knowing that there's a much better life coming. That this world as we know it's going to come to an end. And forever, forever, Lord, we're going to be with you in paradise. And we thank you and give you all the praise and glory. Jesus' name, amen and amen. Praise God.